Hi, and welcome back to the Unconventions Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Roos, and it's a general pleasure to be back. And <laughs> I know it's been a while. I've been focusing on, on promoting the book and working with clients, and, and I've missed this. I've missed being with you. I've missed sharing some really powerful and, and inspiring conversations. Um, and if there's one guest that could get me back behind the mic and revive the Unconventionalist podcast, it's Donald Miller. Um, Donald Miller is the CEO of Business Made Simple, and he is the best-selling author of multiple business books, um, including Building a Story Brand, um, uh, Here on a Mission, and How to Build a Small Business, and How to Grow a Small Business, sorry. And I've just really loved going through and revisiting some of the books that he's written for this particular conversation. And I found a lot of the content online um, were some of the things I've heard Don say before, and I really wanted to have a conversation about things that haven't heard Don talk about or some of the gaps that were missing. But we, we focused a conversation on, on what it takes to build a successful business and why a lot of the things that actually aren't spoken about, such as impulse control, or operational discipline, actually matter a lot. We talked about what it actually takes to craft a meaningful life and why having a vision and, and, and a story for your life that you want to play out is really important, but it's also really hard. Um, and, and we covered so much more. And I really hope you can enjoy this conversation. If you do, let me know. Um, there's a couple of things that you can do to help that would be amazing. One of them is if you enjoy the show, please subscribe to the podcast because it helps promote and share it with others. We can reach more listeners and we can reach more listeners. We can get, you know, bigger, better guests, um, on the show always. Uh, and the other thing is I'd love for you to go and check out my new website, storycast.co. Um, it's been a, a sort of accumulation of years of working with clients behind the scenes and working with leaders and business owners and CEOs, entrepreneurs and founders to help them turn their story into a powerful asset that gets noticed and to learn how to craft the story and tell it in a way that can inspire others and inspire action. I'd love to hear your feedback and please go and check it out. Let me know on LinkedIn uh, if anything comes up and I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about what we're planning behind the scenes behind um, behind that project, but I'm really excited. But in the meantime, I cannot wait to share this conversation with you. I really appreciated Don's time um, uh, spending on the Unconventions podcast, and I think you're going to get a lot out of it. In fact, I know you're going to get a lot out of it. So enjoy. Without further ado, I give you the one and only Donald Miller. It's really good to see you again. Um, last time, and you know, when we met, we were in London. Um, yes. I believe you were you on a sort of sabbatical to finish writing your next book or yeah. something like that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it wasn't as, yeah, I mean, it was kind of a sabbatical. I went over there to get away from meetings and all that stuff and got an enormous amount of writing done. It was awesome. And yeah. brought my wife and our daughter with us. So we had a two year old in London, yes. which is an adventure in itself. Yeah. And uh, we had a blast. We had a great time. Yeah. And it was, it was good to meet you in person. We've got a few friends in common. Uh, shout out to Mike Paccio and Lewis Howes. Yes. And, and a, oh, and a few kind of, it's like, a, it's, it feels like a small, small world. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, there's a few things I want to name first and foremost. The first one is I've got a confession. Yes. Um, I did not read all your books. Okay. I read these. <laughs> I read these. I, I, did either, not Mark. Read, <laughs> I did not read all 13 books. Like out of all the people I've interviewed, you have been oh, a God. prolific writer, but, um, that being said, and and having consumed quite a lot of, of podcast episodes and stuff, there's a lot of stuff that's out there that I think I can point people to, which I think would be beneficial. And if that's okay with you, I'd love to have a conversation about a few questions that I have that I haven't been able to find in these books or in podcast interviews that I've listened to. I'd love it. Let's go. Does that, does that sound okay to you? It sounds um, wonderful. So one of them is like, you know, from the, you know, on this podcast, people kind of like to know a bit of the backstory and we'll get that to in a second about the, the way that you destroyed my business within five minutes of attending the workshop in, in a good way. Um, <laughs> and that is, you know, you, you grew up in, in Texas. Um, yeah. your father leaves at two, you, you come, what I would consider from, at least from a European perspective, seems like a more traditional kind of, um, Christian kind of Baptist Southern church. Yes. You, you, you grew up with your mom working her ass off and not making more than $20,000 a year. So you, you're in line, you know, for government cheese. Yeah. Um, your father walks out when you're two. Um, and that's something I'd like to have at some point. What were you like as a child? Because <laughs> um, I, that is one thing that I just haven't been Absolute able to pain. <laughs> <laughs> My mother deserves a... Uh, I don't know. She she better have a mansion in heaven. I'll tell you that right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, 
I mean, I had a great childhood. I, I had fun. Mom did a fantastic job taking us camping and taking us to plays and, you know, keeping us active. And Christmas was amazing. I mean, I feel for these single moms who are pulling it off. It's a heck of a mm. lot of work. Mm. And um, she was tough. My grandmother was even tougher, just very, mm. very tough. Uh, two tough women, my mother and my grandmother. Uh, and, you know, not super warm or nurturing or any of that, you know, built mm. to survive. Mm. And so kind of grew up in that environment, very poor. Mm. Um, and, had, you know, within the confines of that, had a blast. I mean, just had yeah. a great time as a kid. And uh, I'm sure that said, I'm sure I was an absolute pain in the butt looking back. <laughs> I mean, I have a two and a half year old now and yeah. she's just a dream. I mean, she's just a dream. And I'm like, why am I not getting justice here? We, we've yeah. got to have one more kid because I deserve. <laughs> well, you haven't hit the three ages yet. You know, that might be it. Yeah, the three ages. <laughs> yeah, it might, it might be coming around We're the corner. There. We're seeing elements of that. Um, <laughs> but one, one of the things, because one of the things I was really curious when I was going through all the research, this conversation was, and I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times and you have, it's kind of this on the outside, it looks like you did this big 180, you know, you were writing these kind of Christian kind of vibe memoir esque books, and then you went to do business and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And actually I thought that was a really interesting theme. And, and the one thing that really stood out for me is what I heard is I think you're around 13 and you had a youth pastor in your life who had a really big impact, I guess, in, in your identity and, and, and your path. Um, and I think I heard you say something, which for me really kind of struck a chord. It was something like, he helped me see that I wasn't a burden, but a blessing. Yeah. Um, do you want to say a bit more about that? Because I think it's, it's, it's kind of these events that in our lives that I find are often under stated is like the, these conversations we might have of one person that could change the direction of our life. Right. And so, um, is it David Gentile? David Gentiles. Gen, Gentiles. Yeah. Gentiles. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah he was, uh, I mean, he was, he was the, the in, most influential person in my, in my, in my childhood, my teenage years, um, would be David Gentiles. He was the youth pastor at the church down the street. Hmm. Uh, he came to work there right as I entered junior high and was, you know, an incredibly loving, kind, generous, gracious human being and mm. lots of fun to be around mm. like youth pastors are. And, um, you know, he, 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 he just accepted everybody. And, uh, I was a kid who was fat. I was a dork. I was, uh, bullied at school. But I could walk into this church youth group of about 20 or 30 kids and was loved and accepted there and really had a chance to kind of blossom in mm. that environment, unlike mm. school where that was not happening, Yeah, uh, in that environment. And um, he just was somebody who believed in me. And uh, I dedicated my second book. My first book was dedicated to my mother. My second book was dedicated to him, yeah. Blue Like Jazz. And, uh, you know, to this day. And just an unbelievably influential guy. I don't know that I'll be able to pass on to anybody mm. what he's what he gave to me at that at that time in my life. Well, the other thing that he gave you was an invitation to write an article in the newsletter of the of the of the youth church, and you know, people read it and said, "Hey, Don, that that was actually good writing." And and, and yeah. I think I heard you say that that was like the first time you got praise for something you did. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it feels like it was almost like the catalyst of this journey of discovering 100%. writing as, as maybe a, a potential. Um, and by the way, just, just a side note, um, Gentiles, I think may, might come from the French word gentil, which means kind. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So I was looking into it. So, so I think David Gent literally means David kind. If, if you look at the root of the word. Um, so I, I just want to let you know in case, in case no one had told me that before. And apparently he was notorious for his gumbo. I, I read a, a tribute to him and, and, and there was, um, a really lovely, yeah, tribute. And, and again, I think it was this influence it had on many people's lives and yours included with writing. And, and I kind of fast forward cause there's this gap that's been driving me crazy. I want to find out today. Okay, yeah, yeah. But, so, so, you know, drive forward, you, you're 25 when you start writing, um, your first book is that, is that, you know, you start writing about your it's life. About, yeah, that's 29. about right. Uh, yeah, because um, Blue Cause Jazz, I think, came out when I was twenty nine. You were twenty nine. Yeah, there was a book two years before that. Yeah, 
That's that right. Would, would be about tw- like I would have started writing that about when I was 25. So the thing that I, I didn't realize this, because I know when I looked at, you know, from 2000 to 2009, you wrote like a, a silly amount of books, but Blue Like Jazz, that was 40 weeks on the New York Times bestselling list. And that I heard you say edited 54 times. <laughs> yeah. Obsessive compulsive um, disorder. Yeah. But, but, it, but I didn't realize it was like your second book. Right. There I mean, you struck gold that. pretty, pretty quickly in a way. And, 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 and I'm just curious. Is there anything you can point to? Because I know you don't believe in magic in that sense of like, if that's a success, you can probably pinpoint what happened. Is there anything that you can put your finger on and go like, I think that's, that's might be one of the reasons why Yes, it's stuck. Yeah. It's a guy named Stacy Gorton, who was my roommate. You haven't okay. heard the story, Mark. I, I haven't no. told the story very often, but Stacy Gorton was my roommate. He worked for a ministry called Campus Crusade for Christ that is now called Crew, because the idea of a Campus Crusade for Christ is somewhat offensive <laughs> in today's day. <laughs> you know, like we're going to take over the school. Yeah. But um, he worked for this ministry. It's actually a lovely group of people, an amazing group of people. And um, they did a thing called Freshman Survival Kit. So it would be like, okay. oh, I don't know, like a shaving kit yeah. and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, a yeah. bottle of water and some gum. Yeah. And they would always put a book in there. And it was preferably a book that would sort of help, you know, people see God in a new light. Cause that was what they were doing on mm-hmm. campus. It was a Christian group. Mm-hmm. And my roommate read blue like jazz while I was working on it and said, this should be in the freshman survival kits. Uh, I'm going to call headquarters and tell them to do this. And, and I was like, that's, that's nice. You know, and of course my yeah. first book had been a failure and, uh, and, and, um, It was very controversial because the book, the Blue Lake Jazz is a story about me having grown up in a fundamentalist Christian upbringing in Texas and then moving to Portland, Oregon, where I audited classes at Reed College, which had two distinctions. Yeah. One was the most godless campus in the country. Yes. And and selected by U.S. News. And um, the average IQ was two points above genius. I believe it still is. So these are the smartest kids in America and the most godless kids in America. So- you know, the, the, you know, stories love contrast. And I found myself in a real life contrast. And so wrote a book about it. Um, these, the people at this ministry, Campus Crusade for Christ, read the book and thought, okay, well, it is controversial because he's saying like Christianity gets it wrong yeah, about a lot of things, but he's, he's keeping his faith. And, and aren't we about keeping our faith in college? And that what we're trying to do. I say we stick blue like jazz in this book or in this freshman survival kit. So they did that on campuses around America all at the same time. And, you know, I don't know how many copies at the end of a couple of years they gave out. They printed a really cheap version of it. Yeah. But it was, I mean, it was like 100,000 copies. Yeah. Wow. And okay. that that was okay. enough yeah. fire to start. No, but that, that, that makes sense because it's, it's a good book. I actually finished it on a holiday reading it. And it's interesting because I was raised as a Christian and I kind of, you know, left church, yeah. you know, many years ago. But what I really enjoyed... I think it's your ability. And I think this is one of one of the traits I found through your books and through your work. It feels like if I had to boil down like one of your superpowers, it's to take these complex ideas and to explain them in simple terms or to or to almost humanize things that seem to be really complicated, religion, life, business, you know, entrepreneurship. Um, and you've got a very particular style. Of of I find of your writing, which is like you 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 have humor, and 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 you also humanize the, the process. And what I enjoyed about the book, but like jazz, and I know it's twenty years ago for people listening. This is a book that you wrote twenty years ago. Yeah. Um, it, it's this idea of like I don't like I'm this doesn't really sit well with me, and yet I've also got this thing. So it's this kind of paradox. You kind of you know, you, and and at the end you kind of come to this lovely conclusion that I'll let people find out about. Um, but you write this book, and then you go off and write these these other books, and I know there's a gap in writing. This is the part that I've been scratching my head around. Um, you, you then, you then at some point get asked, and this is what I understand: you get asked by Deloitte to go and work on a project it was management. Close. It was Accenture. Accenture. Sorry, sorry, Accenture. Yes. So you get asked by Accenture to go and work on a project management system or based on storytelling, and and you kind of, you know, obviously that that's the the, the seed of um, story brand, but. How did how did they reach to you? This is this is the this is the gap you know, I have in mind. Is, this has been this has happened a lot. There there were people who who at that time would read Blue Like Jazz, and they were at a company somewhere, 
And occasionally they would say to themselves, yeah, I work for this company and we're bringing in a speaker. This guy, I love this guy's book. I'd love to meet him. I'm going to lobby the powers that be to bring him in to be a speaker. And that happened a lot. And that was sort of my, uh, and so there was a guy there who was just a fan of the book and he thought we would hit it off if we connected. And, and I think he just called and said, Hey, you know, I work for Accenture and we, we kind of work on curriculum and, you know, I love your book. And if this is after a million miles in a thousand years came out, which was about story and story structure yeah. and living a more meaningful yeah. life. Have you ever thought about doing this? Well, we we ended up be, becoming friends. He was just a really good guy, which I'm so grateful. And then we just sort of did this side project together. Wasn't a lot of money in it. Wasn't, you know, wasn't a yeah. big okay. contract or anything like that. Never done anything like that. And that was what stimulated enough thinking to realize, wait, story isn't just about telling stories. Yeah or getting people to turn the page in a book or a movie or something. Um, you can also use it to organize your thinking around project management and around messaging and marketing and around life planning. And I just realized we had this cordless screw that we were only using. We didn't have any attachments. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, you can actually unplug yeah. the write a book attachment and plug in the project management attachment and use the same power mm. to get something else yeah. done. and you know, curiosity sometimes kills the cat and sometimes changes the cat's career. And that's what happened to me. <laughs> I love that. Okay. So there you go. So that was one of the enigmas. I that had. was it. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was, yeah because, it was a gentleman. Because I love it. Again, I didn't know this, but it sounded like actually you started taking companies and, and through this kind of framework and this idea yeah. and before you even wrote the book. And you that's wrote right. this book thinking like, oh, this is like a nerd you know, geeking out about story and business. It's not going to work in 600,000 copies, like fly off the shelves and, and the yeah. rest is history, right? Like story brand starts. And, but one of the things that, and I know you've spoken about this, you say, you know, sometimes people ask you, do you sometimes, you know, get confused for the, for the guy who wrote, um, blue like jazz. Um, and I think if you go back to a bunch of recent, you'll see that it's a natural progression. It feels like, and yet you go from a guy who lives in the woods, like, cleaning toilets and getting food, you know, like this camp with like this, this yeah. journey you're on to suddenly, you know, spending your day in pajamas, sniffing books and going to coffee shops and making scrambled eggs and trying to write books and maybe having like a virtual assistant to suddenly finding yourself running a company with, you know, 40 employees, you know, 10, $50 million turnover. Um, who did you have to become like in, the, in this process in order to, to transition. Cause it's not an easy transition. Yeah. You know, like I remember like you writing something like, I, I feel like a loser when I don't have money, you know, and be like jazz, you know? Yeah. Um, and there's such, it just feels like, it does feel like a contrast. Well, to be but, fair, like I yeah. probably wrote that when, you know, I didn't have money. Uh, let's just say that I struggled to pay the rent every month until I was 30. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm 52 now. And so it wasn't until I had a book take off that I was able, and even then it was a decade after that, that I stopped worrying about where I was, where mm -hmm. money was going to come from. Cause there was a, there's a scarcity mindset that came from actual growing up in actual poverty. And then choosing to write as a career is often a choice to be very poor for a long period of time. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you know, Mark, you know, this as an author yourself, that there's not a lot of money in it. No, no. Uh, even if no. you, even if you hit the New York times, I hate to no, no. tell people there's not a lot of money. <laughs> there's not a lot of money in it. People are often shocked. I remember yeah. seeing uh, an interview with, um, with, uh, the, the drummer from, uh, Nirvana who went on to uh, Dave Lee, Grohl. Like, Foo Fighters, Dave Grohl. And, and, you know, somebody said, how much money did you make off Nirvana? You know, and it's like 50 million. He goes, no, nah. it'll be like 5 million bucks, which sounds like a lot of money. But when you, but you would think it'd be a lot no, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, the truth is record companies made a heck of a lot more money yeah. than he did. Yeah. Uh, and so that's kind of, that. so, so I, I just remember being very insecure, you know, and especially like in, in relationships, because, you know, women in general tend to be attracted to, you know, good looks, competency and mm. earning potential. Mm. And I, I didn't have any of that. <laughs> <laughs> And so I was like, mm. but I finally had money when like, when, when I started getting checks from a best-selling book, I had one thing, I had one thing to offer. Mm. I'm, I'm being a little self-deprecating, no, no, um, but, I get that. but you know, that's how I felt at the time. Mm. And, um, 
So I probably reflected it somewhere in some book on how finally having a little bit of cash made me feel like I was now a part of society that, you know, uh, I don't know that that's ever turned into a love of money. Uh, because I, I'd make decisions almost every day to not make money it, it, yeah. so that I could be with my family or whatever. But, yeah. uh, but I still and, get a lot of security. You know, when you grow up poor, you, you, you're just wondering, yeah. you know, when the other shoe's going to drop and mm. it can get into your psyche. In fact, they did a study on CEOs who take companies to sort of the next level. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. The father. Have you ever yeah, read yeah. this? Yeah. The father. This, the, the, those who don't have a father. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the common denominator. Yeah. Now, the CEOs can do extremely well, yeah. but the actual common denominator of of plugging a CEO in and having them yeah. exponentially grow the company mm. was that they grew up poor and almost, like, almost like that orphan heart. Yeah, What's that? that? That orphan heart. That that yeah, it's like sometimes that orphan heart. About. And that yeah. orphan heart takes most people to prison. But if it's if, it, yes. if you if you actually hook a different wagon yeah. up to it, you can right. you can grow like Boeing. <laughs> well, again, you know, yeah, again, it's it's you, you talk about the villain and the hero. The difference is yeah. how they how they how they are driven by pain. Do they do they try and prevent others from feeling it, or do they inflict it on others to to you know pay the price? Right. Um, yeah. And and so again, you know, as you said, there's there's not that much money in the book. It feels like now. You know, I met you. I think I came across you. I want to say 2016 ish, 2015. It was back when you were selling the story brand online as a standalone program, which, by the way, anybody listening to this was like legit six to seven times the price that you would pay for Business Made Simple, the annual membership, which is now yeah. included in the membership. Yeah. So, you know, if you listen to this, trust me, it's a good deal. Just go to Business Made Simple. But anyway, so I did that back then. And and it blew my mind because, you know, I used to work at Movember, the Movember Foundation, the moustache um, yeah, yeah. charity, and I launched it in France and a few countries in Europe. And we used to have this saying internally is that we're not the rock stars, we're the roadies. Our fundraisers are, are the rock stars. We're here to build a stage. Love They're that. here to have a great yeah. time for 30 days. We want to make sure that they are, you know, rocking their socks off. We're just the, putting the amps up and then we're here to clean up the the, the mess after them. And and we really had that emphasis on basically they're the heroes, like what Nancy Duarte and you say, it's kind of like, you know, they are, they're the hero of the story. Um, but it also feels like now you've, you've managed to develop and, you, and this ability to come up with a product or solving a problem and then matching a book that kind of goes with it, right? That, 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 that kind of, look, if you just want to solve it on your own, you can, but it also feeds into this, this kind of bigger picture of these products and services. Um, is that something that came naturally to you or is that something that you kind of had to learn on, on the fly? I, I don't know. I don't remember ever learning it. I, I remember, uh, I just know that, you know, I would go out and speak when I was only a writer and speaker, I would go out and speak and, and that's how I paid rent. You know, I'd get like $5,000 uh, if I went and spoke somewhere, sometimes a thousand dollars, sometimes $500, whatever I took it. And, uh, I'd go out and I'd speak. And if the audience laughed at something, I'd kind of remember that. Mm. Next time I would bring that in, you know, just like a comedian yeah. working at the DAC, yes. I yeah. was able to sort of build these things. And then once it, once a speech, once I knew it and I knew it worked and I knew the audience responded to it, you know, these weren't comedy acts. These were, these were sort of like philosophical discussions. Mm. Mm. Um, then that would, that would inform, then I'd say, well, I want to write this down. You know, this should be mm. my book because audiences, mm. so it was, I'm sort of beta testing books as a speaker. Mm. And then I would make a commitment for about a year to get all this stuff down. And then even while I was writing it, I'd go out and speak and kind of test the material. Mm. So then I would, then I'd write the book. And then, um, I think I, I had an assistant and then hired somebody else to sort of do some stuff for me. And I, I needed to make more money in order to pay them. And I mean, that was really it. It wasn't like I want to create an empire. It was like, okay, I got it. Maybe if we put together a digital course, yeah. I won't always be worried about whether I'm not going to make payroll with this tiny yeah. staff. So we'd make a digital course and then hmm. it's the same sort of thing. And, and then it sort of grew into an online platform with a bunch of different courses and a certification program. And I don't know that I, I certainly never sat down and mapped it all out no. 10 years yeah. ahead. I don't know that anybody does that. But it's also like, it, it, 
it's also, I find that what's one of your strengths that because you didn't come from a business background, you know, like that traditional kind of business school, whatever it is, um, as you said, MBAs get you for federal reserve, you know, like <laughs> yeah. kind of roles, but not, but not to run. It's like, you just, you just focus on what you knew, you know, needed to be done and worked. And, and just on that, because if people want to find out, you know, a resource, which I thought was really interesting about like how to grow your small business, it's the you know, kind of books that breaks it down into six, six steps plan. One of the thing that I wanted to ask on the back of that, which I've been personally struggling, and I know a lot of people struggle with, is this concept of impulse control and, and operational discipline. Ugh. And I don't know if that speaks to you in any way, but I, I, I know the theory, right? Like I'll read these books, I, I get it, get a very specific, you know, specific problem, specific audience, all this stuff. Why do you think it's so hard for so many people to double down on like, I'm going to own this problem or I'm going to own this niche um, and constantly be chasing left, right, and center, all these different opportunities. Yeah. Well, I think part of it for me is I wrote, I, mean, I wrote six or seven books before I ever turned and started a company. Mm. And if you think about six or seven books, that's, that's thousands of hours <laughs> of trying to figure out what to say next. And mm. also mostly for your first two or three books. And Mark, you know, this, mm. you know, I think the the first book I published was about 54,000 words. I probably wrote 125. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and no. then that, that number got better and better as the books went on. Now, you know, I'll write <laughs> 60,000 words. I'll publish 45, you know, yeah. and, but a writer knows how to throw things away. Mm. You know, people think a good writer knows what to say. They actually know what not to say. Yes. They do know what to say, but what's more important is they know what not to say. And that means focus. Mm. And so I'm grateful for a, a writing career because it taught me how to focus and prioritize what's important and throw out other opportunities. And so that focus allowed me to to grow a company. It also allows me to be, I think, a good husband and a good father mm. uh, because you're sort of saying, well... I could go take this gig in New York, but that's my daughter's birthday. Yeah. And yeah. so um, that's that shouldn't go in the book. Mm. Sounds like the trip to New York is not going to go in the story of my life. And you you mm -hmm. just learn to sort of they call it killing your darling. When I when yeah. I was growing yeah, up yeah. as a writer, I know they that. called it they literally called it killing your babies. And yes, sort yes. Of yeah, so, yeah. so now they say kill your darlings. Uh, but it was much more gruesome than that when I was coming up. Yeah. You, you know, you can fall in love with this idea of going to New York, but now you have a choice. You know, is this going to be in your story mm. or are you going to be at your daughter's birthday party? And of course, you're going to be at your daughter's birthday party. You know, mm. I understand people who aren't able to do some of that and miss it. I'm not trying to make people feel guilty, but you want to catch. Yes. You want to catch as many of that those things as possible and get them out of your story. And so I, mean, I think when we were growing a business, there was this decision to sort of help small business owners grow their business. And we stayed in that lane and didn't get out of it. And that, that is something I think is underrated and often underspoken about when, when I find it, when I, when I, in my circle and my experience, it feels like it's something that I probably comes from, stems from insecurity, you know, like, uh, for example, I'll get a call, say, can you do a keynote about this then? I'm like, oh yeah. You know, because I'm just looking at my, my, well, my and bottom line part, and I'm not, I'm like, I've I got think to, that's you know. a natural thing, right? Like, um, you know, when you're, when you're, before you're married, you're dating. Hmm. And you, you slowly figure out, you know what, actually, I don't want to date somebody who's wired like I am. I want to date somebody who's wired like the opposite of me. You figure those things out yeah. with trial and error. And I think the same thing is also true with with our careers. And you, you're, you're probably 15 to 20 years younger than me. My guess is you're in that, you're, you're right in that phase of going, yeah, I don't actually like that. And even though they offer me money, I'm not going to do it. I, I like yeah. this. And I'm gonna I just this. turned. And I just turned down a gig because it was it was around my kid, my son's birthday, and um and I remember looking at it and going, money's good. I would need to leave on Sunday night really late, and I was like, no, I want to put him to bed. You yeah. know, like I, I, and 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 and, and you'll never regret that. Yeah, and and it's interesting because I heard you say, you know, you were 42 when you got married. Um, you were 49 turning 50 when you had your daughter, and one of the things that this it, I really resonated. You kind of this, this thing I heard you say something like, "I was in a phase." I think it was better to me that told you this that you were in a phase of your life where you weren't scattered and frantic and building, and and the kids are a distraction, right? To what I'm trying to do, and I and and that landed because I I can get stuck in that, 
I can find myself going, oh, I'm I'm torn between trying to, to build an impact and, and also be present with the kids and never really being anywhere. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's a challenge and, and a half. And, and one thing, the reason why I'm bringing this back to, I'm basically just promoting all your books right now, Don. Um, <laughs> Hero on a Mission, you know, it's, it's almost like it's, it's the filter of everything. You know, this kind of idea that if, if you get clear on, on what it is that, you know, the story you want, whether it's your life, your, your family, your, your business, your, your philanthropic work, um, it kind of enables you to say yes and no to things. On that, it, why do you think it's sometimes it's hard to pick one when you feel like you could have multiple, right? So, so like if you could think like, I want to solve mental health, I want to solve employee disengagement, I want to help solve storytelling, like all these kind of things. How, how like any, t- any tips in a minute, I'm conscious of time that you've got done to solve no, that? I, I, well, first of all, I'm not, I'm not perfect at that. Um, I, mm. I would say once or twice a year, my assistant, and also the gentleman who runs my company and the woman who d- directs our operations, we, we will sit down because Don has said yes to too many things. <laughs> so um, I, I guess my answer is I'll, I'll tell you when I figure it out, Mark. Yeah, you, okay. t- you have to promise to tell me when you figure it out. <laughs> okay. But I think, the, I think oh. the, re- the real truth is like you can't, uh, you know, I, I'm the older I get, the more and more convinced I am that the point of life among many, but one of the main points of life is to learn to love who's ever in front of you, Mm -hmm. which is an incredibly inefficient objective. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know that being interrupted by opportunities to care about people is a bad thing, but I will say, um, you know, in that, you know, that being said, mm. if that's the point of life, then how do we make that sort of generosity sustainable? And in order to make things sustainable, you, you got to say no to a lot of stuff and you've got to be able mm. to focus. So, mm. you know, my thing is like, I want to, I want to care about small business owners. Uh, I want to care about my team and my staff, mm. and I want to care about my family. Mm. And truthfully, in the opposite order, family, then my team, mm. and then, and then, yeah. Because if I do those two things, our customers are going to feel very, very cared about and loved, and they're yeah. not going to be cared about by a hypocrite. Uh, you know, and so I, I think that's if we just kind of keep that in mind, mm. and then we don't say, well, Don has the opportunity to go do Jimmy Fallon, mm. and you know, that well, how does that opportunity help me love my family or my team or our customers? Uh, and if it does, then we're going to do it. If it doesn't, then we're just not going to do it. Now we hit that ball over the plate about 80% of the time. Mm. And the other 20% always causes trouble. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, yeah. And I, and I think, again, it goes back to the idea of that impulse control and operational discipline, this idea of just focus. Um, I'm conscious of time and and, and I want to, I want to respect that. No, we're good. But I've got to say this because. So I come to story brand workshop in London and I, you know, I've read the book and, uh, Big shout out to Kenny Kemp, who's um, probably going to be listening to this, uh, who's one of the coaches at, uh, who's one of the certified coaches. And he was like, oh, there's this workshop in London. You should go and check it out. Um, and you come up and I'm excited because I'm like, I want to clarify. Like, I just want to go deep and clarify my marketing message. And I'm launching this thing. Um, originally it was called Learn Your Story, but now it's called Storycast, uh, which is based on my book, right? Glow, glow, uh, glow in the Dark. And the whole premise of my book is this idea that your personal story um, is the emotional glue your audience has been waiting for to connect with you. And you get on stage. I don't even remember this. You, you come up at the front of the room. It's not, it was a small intimate event. It wasn't like, yeah, yeah. and you come at the front and you go um, something like telling your story will not grow your business. <laughs> I'm just sitting there going, oh, Don, you just killed just but kidding. Mark, you know that I love what you do. And and the reality is, um, I also give a caveat later that there's a you way did. to tell you your did. story that actually greatly yeah. enhances your business. But yeah. I think I probably did that more as a shock jock than uh, Yeah, no, no, you did. And and what's interesting is because, you know, what's and I don't know if you realize I'm, I know you do this probably naturally or maybe unconsciously, but you often will use a small backstory uh in a way to set up uh the context 
of, uh, as to why you maybe write this book or why you launched this product or why you, so for example, when you were in that workshop, I don't know if you remember this, you started by saying, I was an author, you know, I'm being booked to give speaks, I'm on stage and half the room is empty. And I'm like, what's happening? You know, I need to focus on marketing and that's how you got interested in marketing. So, But in that few seconds, you've distilled a little story that made us feel like, oh, you get us, you know, the empathy and authority, like you, you understand yeah. us. And and I think that's that's kind of what I did in my book. And I guess I want to get, get you back on the record, Don. And I want to say, I want to hear you say <laughs> in, in what ways have you found that beneficial, I guess, for business leaders, entrepreneurs, um, founders to, to take the time to unpack their stories and understand, actually, these are the stories that are relevant for my customer to make them feel un understood. Well, you know, like, yeah, let me answer that in a couple of ways from my perspective, Mark. And, and I think there's a really good chance that you actually know more about this than I do. And so mm -hmm. in some ways I come to you with humility. Um, and I say that because you've written a book on it. And when you've actually spent the time to write a book on it, you, it's like you've got a PhD. <laughs> and um, so, but let me, I think there are two reasons. Let me answer a similar question that I hope dances around mm -hmm. and covers what you're you're hoping to understand. But I think there are two reasons that it's extremely important that you tell your story. One of them has non-commercial. And that is that when you when you can sit down and articulate your story to somebody who is invested in you, cares about you, a friend, uh, to some degree, maybe even a new acquaintance, mm -hmm. when the objective is to get to know each other, there's no more powerful way to connect with somebody than to, to be able to tell your story, period. Mm -hmm. And human connection is a necessity for survival. And so the, to learn to to articulate your story and where you come from uh, is, is important for your your own mental health. It, it also it causes you to be remembered in that person's mind in a very, very special and amazing way. Mm. Uh, so so that's just human to human. I think as we get into leadership, mm. I would say, look, if you're talking to an audience of 2000 people, and you get up there and say, I want to tell you about my childhood. The audience is wondering why they're there and why this person's childhood is worth listening to in order to help me somehow survive. So they're mm. actually looking for something that's relatively selfish. Mm. And I think but selfish in the sense that it's helping them survive. So is that selfish? You know, mm. I don't know. I think it seems like pretty natural to me. Mm. I, I, what I would say is that what you need to do is if, if you're in a leadership position where you're leading a company is yes, tell your story, but you want to tell your story. You want to tell only part of your story. And it's the part of your story in which you struggled with something the audience is struggling with and you overcame it. Mm. I think if we, if we get up, you know, let's say you attend a conference about how we've got to make airplane engines uh, more eco-friendly. Mm -hmm. And you get up and you tell your story about struggling with this problem, not understanding how to do it. And then at the end of your talk, you say, and I still don't know how to do it. So Good thank luck. you very much. My name is Don Miller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so there's two elements. One is the struggle, but the other is you've actually developed a competency in this area. Mm. Now, if you tell, if you said that, uh, Don, you can, you know, I'm a, I'm an executive and I want to get up and tell my story because I've just taken over a position at a company and there are going to be shareholders in the room and literally our stock price can dramatically be affected by what happens when, when I'm on that stage for 30 minutes. Mm. Uh, I am probably going to instruct you as you would. I want you to tell the backstory of how you used to run a struggling company and then you learned how to fix it. Right. And here's what you learned. And now you're going to take what you've learned into this new position. Yeah. And that's why people can expect things to get better around here. Yeah. In a way, you've mm. tricked people into thinking you've told your story, but you really didn't. Mm. Now, let's say you leave the stage, stock price soars, and you're meeting with some principal investors who want to help you merge with another company. And you guys are all having whiskey in a back room, smoking cigars. And somebody just says, tell me about yourself. Mm. At that point, you have been invited, I think, to do a lot more than it. So there's yeah. different. You just got to like know that. which parts of your story to yeah. tell at, at which time. And that's. And it, and it, and it, and it takes that work, right. To be able to just, just kind of go through almost like the Lego pieces of your life to understand actually, yeah, this, this, this part. And I think what I picked up from what you're saying, which resonates a lot with what I talk about in the book is 
sometimes I say it's not even about sharing your story. It's about who you become as a result of owning your story. Because I think a lot of shame is tied to our background and to our stories and gets in the way of us showing up more powerfully in our communities and in our, in our, in our family and at home and at work. And, and what I've seen in the leaders going through this process is just unbelievable. This idea that they used to play defense and they were scared that people might find out stuff about them. And then they just focus on what the end goal and the mission of the company is rather than, you know, what, 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 what people might find about them. So um, I'm glad we've got that clarified down on the, on the, on the record. <laughs> um, look, we're coming to the end. So I'm going to ask you, I, I could ask you a thousand other, other questions. It'll be for another time. If I'm in Nashville, I'll let you know, we can meet up for a coffee and I would um, love that Mark. And, uh, and, and we can dive deeper, but um, two last questions. I'm going to stick to two questions. One of them is I heard you say the few, the, the vision was to build a company to hundred million dollars. And then in that scenario, there's a possibility that um, you homeschool the kids and you spend the rest of your time writing novels yeah. or y- you go into politics. Um, it almost feels like you're an Arnold Schwarzenegger three act kind of guy. And, you know, you wrote memoirs, you got into business and it feels like politics might be the next thing. I'm just curious where you're at with that. You know, I'm doing both. I I, I do believe that that there's something about a three act structure that works. The brain likes it. Now there are four act plays. There's all sorts of anomalies, but most, if you if you were going to write a simple book, a simple story that people would understand, you would do it in three acts. Mm. And because of that, I kind of think maybe life can have three acts too. And it sort of does. There's this mm. sort of childhood adolescence act. Then there is the the getting started in your career and family act. And then there's the act where you become the sage who's turning around, helping other people figure mm. out their difficulties. You know, na- life naturally sort of divides itself up if we're lucky enough to live that long. Mm. And um, I think there's been a career track for me. One is learning how to write uh, and figuring out how to write and figuring out myself and sort of being public about that in the form mm. of memoirs. Then there's building a company and helping other people build their companies. Two two very different acts. Mm. Both of them have the common thread of writing books. Mm. And then there's the third act, which which might be politics. Uh, there was I was very seriously researching um, and putting a team together to run for Congress mm. here in Tennessee and made a decision not to do it. Mm. Um, but part of that decision was because I was offered an opportunity to do messaging for one of the largest largest political efforts in in the history of the country. Mm. Uh, and I work with a team behind the scenes with, mm. you know, hundred million dollar budgets on mm. how, on, on some political stuff happening in the United States. And, um, we're in a lot of trouble and, and yeah. as a country, because we're becoming more and more divided and we're trusting each other less and less. So there's some initiatives to help solve that and yeah. redeem that. And they've asked me to come in and do that. So, you know, that is happening while I'm also writing my first novel, which is a business novel. Mm-hmm. So it's not a real novel, yeah. uh, but it's a story and it's very, very fun to write it. You know, and if the political stuff takes off, that's great. If the novel stuff takes off, that gr- that's great. But I, I do think the political stuff is sort of first in terms of a calling. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't work or if there's mm-hmm. not a need for me or a place for me in that mm-hmm. in that place, then I would uh, I have a great plan B that would be yeah. very fulfilling for me. Yeah. So who knows what act three will look like, but those yeah. are two of the things I'm playing with. And I appreciate that. And, you know, another time, another day, I would have loved to talk about the Israeli-Palestine conflict. Um, I know <laughs> that's an area that you're very interested in, but there is a quote I heard you say that I, re- I wanted to share because I think it was, it was kind of like it marked a point. You know, you said at the core, problems can be resolved if you find yes. the people who are tender and willing to take action. If, yeah, if, there, if you find the empathetic ones. Yeah. And they are, and you yeah. know, just to talk about this because you know it is a it is a bit of a divergence from what we've been talking about. But you know, I've been to Israel many times. I've been to the settlements that were attacked by Hamas. Uh, I've met with the PLO in the PLO headquarters inside the West Bank. Met with former Israeli generals. Met with the ambassador from Israel to America, Michael Oren. Uh, met with uh, members of Knesset. Um, I, th- I think that. There's some, you know, if I, if I were, if I had to pick a side, I would pick the Israelis. Mm. Uh, but I also, I would also say <clears throat> that there's something missing on, on both sides as it relates to leadership. And that is the willingness to sort of extend trust. 
and to find the people who are promoting peace and who really genuinely believe that peace is possible and give mm. them the microphone. That is, that's just not happening on either side mm. of that conflict. Mm. Uh, it is a zero sum game on both sides. It is, uh, yeah, I remember saying to a member of Knesset, mm. uh, sat and had dinner with him and said, look, you know, Jesus influences Tolstoy. Tolstoy influences Mohandas Gandhi. Gandhi influences Martin Luther King. There's a, there's a thread of, of nonviolence mm. and, uh, that goes throughout history that has been perhaps the most effective mm. at social change. Um, it's certainly been effective. You'd have to mm. argue that. You couldn't argue against that. I said, is that element alive mm. in Israel or in Palestine? Is it, is it getting any traction, this sort of nonviolent resistance? Um, and he just stared blankly at me mm. and for a long time. And I finally said, I'm sorry, sir, am I, am I being naive? And he just pointed at me, he goes, yes, you're being naive. Yeah. And what that showed me was mm. that, that, that element of turning the other cheek and figuring out a way to resolve conflict certainly, certainly mm. is dead and non-existent with Hamas. It's, got, it's it's all they want is vengeance. One hundred percent, and and, and they are willing to, to die the themselves thing, yeah. and kill innocent children on their own of their own ilk. Yeah, to make that happen. And then on the other side, you have the the IDF and Netanyahu and the leadership there that is basically saying um, we're not going to be super careful about women and children getting killed here. We're going to go after these guys no matter what. And, uh, <laughs> And so both sides, you know, it, it's, everybody wants, which one's a good guy, which one's a bad guy. I, I'd say it's somebody who, neither side actually has a very, uh, a mindset that promotes peace. It's it's a zero sum game. Yeah. And it's also they're stuck in their own stories. I find that it's, it's kind of right. like, the, the, there's, there's no, the, so there's, you know, there's no, let me walk, let, let me see your perspective, in, you know. And then I think it's easy, obviously, for me to say this from where I stand, but it's like, when I look at it from that storytelling perspective, it's like both are so anchored in this belief that their story or their version of the story is the only story, as opposed to what I once heard yeah. you talk about vulnerability. Um, vulnerability, I think you said, when you're being vulnerable with someone else, you're effectively handing them a weapon. Um, yep. And there's something about that, and I don't know what it is, and I don't know what that looks like, but there's something about this ability to, okay, when am I willing to, when am I, when am I willing to give up for the sake of a vision that we can all benefit from? And I don't know. I don't know if that's happening now. No, it's definitely not happening in that conflict. And yeah. that that idea, that ethos is is dying slowly in America, too. Yeah. And we see where it goes. We we absolutely know where this goes. Yeah. But it's difficult to guide it and control it. <laughs> I think the um, you know, the future is in our hands and hopefully we'll we'll do better than we're doing now. One hundred percent. I've taken too much of your time. Um, I have. I've loved the, the conversation, though, Mark. And the, do let me know if you come through Nashville. Yeah, no, 100%. And uh, and we'll get back on the podcast. And look, generally, I want to say thank you for the books. But more than that, it's it's kind of, um, I haven't got any better words than say just a thank you for caring. Because it <laughs> feels like at, at the core, you know, when you talk, you know, especially that you made the time to be on this call when you could have been with your family, you could be with your team. So don't take it for granted, you know, that you, you, you would take an hour of your time to speak with some weird Brit over the channel, um, but well, that's um, that's not remotely. You 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 were you were been so impressive in the time that we've been able to spend together, and uh, the fact that you would trust me with your audience means an enormous amount. So I'm I'm very very grateful. Anytime. Thank you very much, Don. There you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. I really hope that you got a lot out of this conversation too. And I know we touched on a lot of different topics. You might have some questions, so make sure to write them below on the comment section on YouTube, or just send me a DM over on LinkedIn. Um, I read every single comment uh, or DM that comes my way. If you enjoy the show, please make sure to subscribe. Um, I really recommend you go and check out uh, all Don's books. Some of my favorite are, are Hero on a Mission, um, Building a Story Brand, A Million Miles in a Thousand Years. Actually, we didn't actually get to talk about that in the book, but that book is brilliant. And Blue Lights Eyes, I thought was really interesting as well. I can see why it, it, it made a huge success. And finally... I have one last request, and that is if you've bought a copy of Glow in the Dog, if you've read it or listened to it, please go on Amazon and leave a review to celebrate this book anniversary, book anniversary um, of one year. It would mean the world to me, and I always love reading your comments over on Amazon. So thank you so much for your time and your patience with me as I navigate 
how to juggle everything, including this podcast. But I've got a few guests and I'm going to be very selective with the guests I bring on board, um, very specific people who inspire me, but also where we can draw some of the lessons that I cover in Glow in the Dark around the importance of sharing your personal story to connect with others and inspire trust and action. And, and I've got a few people on my sleeve that I'm, I can't wait to get on the show. So in the meantime, I hope you know that your story matters. And if you knew how powerful your story was, you wouldn't be sitting on it. I'll see you next time. Until then, be well.